Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Boss Rush Podcast, a great place to play games and be better. I'm one of your hosts, Corey Deergan. Alongside me, as always, is the PC Muscle Race himself, Laron Dawkins. What's poppin'? Hey, Laron. Hey, Corey. Laron, I gotta tell you. I gotta tell you. I watched Deadpool and Wolverine this weekend. Mm-hmm. And it was very, very good. Oh, man. You know, you know that feeling that everybody got when that when Spider Man came out like three years ago. <laughs> yeah, everybody was excited to see all these Spider Men flinging around. Yeah, that's how I felt. That's how I felt <laughs> watching this movie. Okay, this was my Spider Man. Okay, speaking of uh, Spider Man, I don't really know what kind of transition we're doing here, so we're just gonna go with it. Uh, we have two two special guests tonight. They're on one is from our writing team on the website, bossrush.net. And the other is a fellow podcaster with a great podcast. But first, we're going to introduce Sophie, our writer from the writing team, bossrush.net. Sophie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, I can I can say I am Spider-Man if that's a good enough transition. We can go for it. <laughs> it's fine with me. Secrets Maybe. out. Um, Who are you? Why, why should people pay attention to you? Uh, I'm the youngest one here. And <laughs> I have charm, and I said, give I people a reason to pay attention. I like, I like how he, I like how he led with it. I know <laughs> he's, he's he's really leaning into it, huh? It's yeah, the youth it's, movement. It's, yeah, yeah, it's the youth movement. It's my character now. It's my character trait. Uh, <laughs> uh, sh- new writer here for Boss Rush, and I'm looking forward to writing more. And uh, feel like podcasting is always something I wanted to be a part of, and this is like a good opportunity for me to you know speak my voice. Say what I need to say. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me again, Corey. Absolutely. Look, we we've got enough of them. So anytime you want to just jump on one, you know. <laughs> sweet. Uh, but also here, speaking of speaking of podcasts, met met this human being at PAX. Uh, introduced uh, to me by Stephanie. Uh, has a great podcast called Tales from the Backlog. Dave Jackson is here. Dave, welcome to the show. I love your podcast. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words and thank you for inviting me on the show and apologies for uh, having to delay the recording, but uh, a little, little wait, never hurt anybody, I guess. I'm happy to be here. That's right. That's right. That's what your show is all about. Waiting. to play. That's right. Yeah. Right. So uh, (laughs) Dave, why don't, why don't you tell everybody what your show is about, who you are and why they should listen to your podcast? Sure. So Tales from the Backlog is a weekly deep dive podcast. Every week is a different game uh, under the microscope. And so uh, I, it's, you know, from the backlog, we say, so it's always things that are not necessarily brand new, uh, not a retro show, but not on the cutting edge of the new releases of the week either. And the way that I record and, you know, space things out, if I do a, a brand new game, by the time it hits my show, it's six months late. So Uh, Don't come to my show for like the hottest new releases. Come to my show for those things that you may have passed over and might be sitting in your Steam library because you bought it for three bucks and forgot about it. Uh, That's (laughs) my show. Uh, And then the other thing about my show I want everyone to know is that um, every episode is spoiler free for a while. And then there's a break in the middle. And then afterwards, it's full spoiler. So anyone can listen to any episode of my show for deep uh, you know, hopefully helpful analysis about the game uh, without being spoiled for quite some time. And they're long episodes. So you get about an hour ish of non spoiler in every episode. Hold on, hold on, pause. <laughs> Corey, what? You set me up because last night we were, we were, we were in like a 30 minute, 30 minute like, like video call. And I was talking about, <laughs> man, like, Man, like these games are like dirt cheap, but I know I'm just gonna slam them right into my backlog and never play. I, I, I'm talking like Panzer Dragoon remake for PC, the Deus Ex collection, mm. uh, both Judgment games. Like, look, I didn't tell you to buy those games. Yeah, I, I haven't bought them yet. They're sitting in my cart though. Mm-hmm. You're gonna hit I mean, by an hour. Really, come on, man. They're come on, man. They're they're just so cheap right now. <laughs> like like Judgment for the PC is fourteen forty on Green Man Gaming. Like uh, plug for them, by the way. Uh, mm-hmm. Lost Judgment, this the second part, and you know, like one of the more critically acclaimed ones. Uh, it, it's all part of Yakuza, by the way. Like for you people in the, or like a dragon for you for yeah. people who want to be fancy now. Like yeah. that one's that one's twenty two dollars right now. The Panzer Dragon remake on the PC. If you have not gotten it, or you like me and got the and got the very horribly unoptimized Nintendo Switch version, it's two dollars right now on PC. 
Mm. What are you talking about? Every game on the Nintendo Switch is totally optimized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plays best on Switch on every box. You set me up, Corey. We're, we, we're going to have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to have a conversation. This podcast would be terrible if we didn't. Um, <laughs> Dave, th thanks. Thanks for joining us tonight. It's been a it's been a long time coming. I'm very excited to have you here. Are you going to PAX West? I am not. But uh, oh. if you are going to PAX East next year, I hope to be there. Great, because uh, it was very, PAX is awesome. If if yeah. anybody out there has a chance to go, it's it's quite the experience. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, speaking of speaking of PAX, uh, we are headed to PAX. Uh, join me, Pat, Stephanie, Ed and David Lasby uh, as we cover the event from the event with articles, podcasts, interviews, behind the scenes footage and all that kind of stuff. PAX West takes place August 30th through September 2nd. Watch out for content on the website. Uh, it's going to be a good time. Gonna going to be a good time. Uh, but also, if you want to support the Boss Rush Podcast and the Boss Rush Network, you can head over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash Boss Rush Network. Subscribing to the tiers on our Patreon grants you perks like new exclusive pre-show, voting rights for spoiler casts and video game book club, exclusive questions, threads for interviews and spotlights, early access to After Dark and more. As always, though, your viewership and listenership is enough for us. So if you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell, like the video, leave a comment. A lot of comments recently thank you guys for leaving comments very very grateful for those comments uh if you're listening on apple Podcasts or spotify you are using chrome sir uh <laughs> you distracted me with your fireworks uh, <laughs> my bad <laughs> fine i do it sometimes uh <laughs> man uh if you listen on apple Podcasts or spotify uh leave us a rating or a nice review over there as well you can catch all of our content, including banters, features, listicles, reviews, and more over on our website at bossrush.net. Got a lot of content coming up, everybody. Uh, a lot of a lot of content. Dave, you've you've got a lot quite a bit of uh content coming up. Oh what yeah. Got, what do you got coming on? I, I I stay busy. So I've got Tales from the Backlog every week, new episodes. Um, but I do want to shout out a couple of guest things that I've uh that I'm doing and uh Thing. in the past by the time people hear this stuff will be out i uh, want to spread the love for uh, p others that invite me on their uh, their projects so first of all i'm part of a big tournament a big retro games tournament called the king of games over on the retro hangover podcast uh, every year they do a different tournament where they pit all the best games from a, a certain year against each other in a you know bracket style to figure out what is the king of games for that year and the tournament that's going on right now is 1996. So I'm a part of that. We've got a bunch of, uh, you know, heavy hitters from that year. Super Mario 64, Tomb Raider, Resident Evil 1. A uh, lot of good stuff from 1996. Wow. So over on Retro Hangover, I'm a part of, uh, I think it was maybe four or five episodes in that tournament. So go show them some love. They're a wonderful show. And then over on the uh, Your Friendly Neighborhood Gamers podcast, I joined them for a big discussion about the Elden Ring DLC, uh, which is uh, one of my favorite things that I've played this year. So uh, if you want to hear me talking about Elden Ring uh, over on your friendly neighborhood gamers. Nice. It's, uh, yeah, uh, Retro Hangover podcast. I, I think you retweeted something about them recently and I've started following them and it's uh, good people over there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Sophie, you got anything cool coming up? You got any uh, to... coming up? I mean, I'm still starting out in my career, so I don't know if I got a lot to really shout out or plug. Um, I'm sure you do. Uh, Boss Rush Network, guys, read my articles. Yeah, at a boy. Uh, other writers' <laughs> articles. Uh, I think it's one of the more well organized news articles I've been to, and it's really, really good. I'm actually like so proud of being a part of all this. If I don't, yeah, well, yeah, it's awesome. You can, uh, you can thank David for keeping that website organized because <laughs> I gotta, t I, I gotta tell you, man, that website would be a hot mess if it wasn't for David. Uh, not that, not that we couldn't do it, but look, David is so organized and very, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, From time I've known, he 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 is the type to be that, yeah, yeah. Ron, you got anything cool coming up? 
Um, just uh, stay tuned uh, for because on episode 118 of uh, Boss Rush After Dark, we have a special announcement. And by special Ooh. announcement, I mean we are inducting a new co-host to the show. Yeah, and I know who it is, and I'm very excited. Yeah, let's no just spoilers. say this. Let's just say this person fits very well in that category. <laughs> for real, for real. And it's, it's about to get. Uh, <laughs> oh, it it's wasn't a, R-rated it's already. It's about to go down. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, as as for uh well let's plug stephanie's stuff first she's going to be on the video game trivia uh with jacob mccourt at pax west uh which is very exciting so that'll be i think it's being live streamed somewhere uh mm -hmm. on one of pax's 75 twitch channels um at 9 p.m uh pacific time so midnight eastern um over there so i'm, I'm very proud of her I'm, gl I'm glad she gets to do that we're going to be there and support um I'm going to secretly text her answers if she doesn't know them so, <laughs> and I'll probably be wrong. That's OK. Uh, she also has uh, a bunch of spotlights coming up, including one with Angry Demon Studios uh, that's coming up next week. And she also has one with uh, Ritual Studios, the developer of the music game Fretless coming up in September. Uh, we have information that cannot be public till after Gamescom, so uh, you can look forward to that. Uh, as for me, my episode of Fun and Games uh, side quests is out for Hellblade 2. Uh, that was really, really fun. Uh, shout out to Matt Storm and uh, Fun and Games podcast. They will be guesting on the show in a couple weeks. Ooh, Matt Storm is good people. Yeah, great, great people. people. You have Matt and Jeff? Uh, just Matt for now. Okay. I need to get I need to reach out to Jeff, too, but nice. I, I met. I met Jeff at PAX. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're great. They're people. both great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I am also uh, scheduling my appearance on The Last Word, which is Destiny Podcast with friend of show Lord Cognito from the Iron Lords uh, and Ibantis, YouTuber Ibantis. And let's just say uh, those sh those episodes are going to be pretty spicy in the next couple of uh, weeks. Uh, so, <laughs> you know. But that's uh, that's what's coming up. Also, book club stray is out now to the public paper Mario's Patreon. So check those out. Time to get into what we've been playing. Uh, Dave, you are our esteemed guest. We're gonna let you go first. Ooh, OK, so I'm always playing a ton of stuff. And uh, so with the way that I play and time and schedule things for Tales from the Backlog, I am usually playing things three months before they arrive on the show. So right now, in July, I'm playing my horror games for uh, for the October podcasts. So uh, the summer is horror time for me. So I am playing uh, Deadly Premonition uh, from the Xbox 360, uh, one of the most polarizing games ever made. Um, notable for like a lot of people saying it's one of the best things ever made and a lot of people saying it's complete trash. Uh, so I'm <laughs> playing that. I am playing Omori. Actually, I just finished Omori, which I really, really loved. Uh, wonderful, wonderful storytelling in that game. Uh, surprisingly good combat system. I I'm always like, I don't know, turn-based combat can just be kind of a thing that you do. You know, you just kind of tap buttons and get through the game. Uh, Omori's not like that. I really enjoyed that. But all shout out to the story, the art, the music uh, in that game. It's wonderful. And um, also uh, one of the games you can pick up for two bucks on Steam all the time, System Shock 2. I'm playing that. Uh, real old influential game. One of those games that inspired a lot of my favorites like Bioshock, which is made by the same people. So uh, Bioshock and then Prey from Arcane Studios. Ooh. One of those games, you know how like you like you play some of the newer stuff and then you go back and you play the inspiration and then you like all those puzzle pieces just click together about those newer yeah. games that you like where you're like, oh, I see what they did. They did this from the exactly from the older game. I have so many moments like that playing System Shock 2 because Prey and Bioshock are basically just continuations of System Shock. So uh, I'm really enjoying that. It's uh, a little bit old, older PC game, 1999, but 
Uh, it holds up really well. I, I'm really enjoying that. And uh, like I said, Deadly Premonition, very polarizing game. A lot of people say it's garbage. It is, uh, it's it's complicated. Some parts of it are garbage. Some parts are very good though. Uh, and it's like, if you like Twin Peaks, it's it's something you you should try out. So that's what I've been playing. There's a bunch of other stuff always, but I talk too much. I'm sure they'll come up at some point. Oh, you you can talk about it if you want. So no, it, it's good. Cool. We got we got other segments to talk about other games I'm playing too. So yeah, we yeah we definitely we definitely do. Uh, <laughs> Sophie, what are you playing? Oh man, okay. Uh, while we're on that turn based topic earlier from Memory, I am currently playing Final Fantasy X. But Ooh. if I'm going to commit to it or not, is very is on debate right now. No, you I are. Have, the, the correct I, answer is you are going <laughs> yeah. to admit. We're making that decision for <laughs> okay. you. Sorry. You're making that decision for me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a couple complaints and a couple positives, a couple negatives about Final Fantasy Sen. But right now, I think I am putting a bookmark on it and I will continue to finish the Mass Effect trilogy, which mm-hmm. I had no okay. idea was that good of a trilogy. I Ugh. got into Mass Effect 1 a couple weeks ago completely blind not knowing what to expect oh, and it completely blind, blind. i don't wow. know any, yeah so lucky wow. yeah <laughs> oh it, you're that, so that lucky last, i had no idea shepherd oh, no idea spoiled untouched oh my god oh, the, the cathedral I I nothing do like, i didn't know anything about it and Playing it is just um the the ending the sort of character writing was beautiful and I loved it so much and I'm currently in the middle of Mass Effect two and I stopped playing Mass Effect two to continue playing Final Fantasy ten and so that was like going from like eating like Michelin star restaurant food and then going to the like uh, Red Robin down the street you know what I mean <laughs> they're both they're both good but I feel like. The Mass Effect trilogy was, I was getting my money's worth with that. You know what I mean? Oh, but Red Robin, you get endless fries. You get That's your money's right. worth there. <laughs> isn't it isn't it beautiful when you like play something with as much hype and a like mass appeal as Mass Effect and it just it lives up to it and you're like, this yeah, is I actually really good. It's it's mm-hmm. wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. Man, yeah, like it, yeah, like I can I can honestly say the original Mass Effect trilogy. Uh, that is that is not overrated. No, oh, it's not overrated. Man, like, Saren, like there's if, there's some speed bumps along the way, but it's not an overrated series. Oh man, dude, That's Saren awesome. is one of the That's best awesome. villains in in video games. In video period. game, yeah. in video game history. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I would put Saren up there with like Revan and like you know some of these. Saren is just a cool villain. I Kefka, love Kefka, design. Kefka from Final amazing. Fantasy VI. <laughs> Yeah. Sin from Final Fantasy X. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you are, I, have my, I have my tidbits. I have my. I have you, my yeah. you, you. You're but, talking. You're talking to a Final Fantasy X super fan here, but like, I mean, you're allowed to have critiques about it. It's not okay. A perfect maybe game. if I was around, I love the Final Fantasy games. Whoa, I love. He was Final, around when it came out. Whoa. Whoa. Well, well, I'll get to that. I love Final <laughs> Fantasy VII. Right. I played the original one. Right. Uh, kind of push through it uh and well worth it i love the narrative of it i love the themes of it and i play final fantasy 15 again love the narrative love the themes it wasn't as good as seven obviously but just one of the games that i one of the first final fantasy games i played uh so i'm kind of still kind of biased on that and i have played but not completed i'm not sure final fantasy 4 the mm. remake version of the nintendo ds that's the one yeah I played. yeah uh but with 10, can I get into this? Like, is this like a, can we like move yeah, on? Yeah. Okay, I'll get into it's, it. I'll get into it. It's a 20 it. so plus it's 10. game. It's spoilers for <laughs> Final Fantasy 10, everybody. <laughs> With 10, it's just like, it. the turn-based combat felt more stale than Final Fantasy 7 turn-based combat. I don't know why. It could be the aesthetics. It could be the fact that the enemies don't attack during uh yeah. your turn um but i just it it felt more st- it felt like a chore to get through most turn based games combat is kind of a chore but this one especially uh was a chore and i did pick up final fantasy 10 
couple years ago just for me to drop it again. Uh, so this is sort of like second try. Still kind of felt the same feeling, but I did get further apart. I did get to a certain point where we realize who Sin really is. That's still kind of early on, mm-hmm. right? Uh, um, but I, at that point, I'm like, I don't. I didn't find it in me to keep going forward. I didn't like get drag. I, I I pushed myself until I was expecting at some point the narrative to push me the rest of the way, but I just didn't feel that tug, uh, metaphorically speaking. But I, I just I looked at my Xbox One and I'm like, Mass Effect is right there. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's yeah, right. That, there. that happens. Look, yeah. Look, here's the thing. You should you should finish Mass Effect first. I'm gonna as, <laughs> as somebody who loves Final Fantasy X. See, this you feels should. like this feels like a bias is is what? working itself in there. But I'm actually going to join you on this. Finish Mass Effect. Okay. Yeah. It's. Um, I mean, I, you can you can be playing two great games, and if one of them is speaking to you more, then you're just not going to like the other one as much. So you yeah. gotta you gotta yeah. follow the one that you're enjoying more. Why Definitely. why force why turn one game into homework when you could be playing mm-hmm. the one that you really want to play? Right. That's what it exactly. feels like Final Fantasy Ten does feel like homework to me. Yeah, it's because you want to play Mass Effect, and yeah. I refuse to believe it's because Final Fantasy Ten is actually not good. Yeah, oh, no, no, Final no, Fantasy Final I, Fantasy X is good. It's oh, good no, I feel like if I went to it in a different mindset, it's good. I love the I love the mm-hmm. themes. We can like the whole questioning religion thing has always been like yeah, a yeah. awesome mm-hmm. thing for me. And yeah, I think it's really awesome, interesting. But yeah, yeah. I also think, especially like at the time when Final Fantasy X came out on PS2, like the reason why the combat is so simple is because the big thing was like they were really pushing graphics oh, and yeah. CG cutscenes. And voice acting, because this is the first Final Fantasy game that had voice acting in it. So those were like the big selling points of the game. It wasn't the combat. It was yeah. it was that. And and um I think that's why it was such a huge deal when it came out, right? Because it was coming out, it was that, and then it was like Metal Gear Solid 2 and Zone of the Enders, and like there were some major like yeah. cinematic games really starting to roll out for PS2. Right. Yeah. And I feel and, like that's yeah. what I meant by like saying if I was there at the time, you know, mm-hmm. then maybe yeah. that sort of like graphical influence that people were, you know, their minds being blown because of it. I feel like I would have, if I experienced it too, I would have like, would have able had the, I would have had like the, the, uh, love for it enough to keep pushing through. But yeah. 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 Well, if you think the combat in 10 is boring, then finish 10 and then play the sequel 10 too, because a lot of people like that combat a lot more and it's a lot more active. It's, it's more okay. like that old, that old ATB style. Uh, okay. And it's also a super unique game, which, uh, and I think it gets too much hate. I think it's really good. I, I, I know there's a lot of games where you can play anime waifu dress up now. Yeah. But okay. there's, there's, there's not a whole lot where you deal with the, you deal with the fallout of what happens at the end of final fantasy 10. So, yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah. Man. Awesome. But yeah, yeah that's just I, my opinion on that. Yeah. Yeah, you should you should finish Mass Effect. I <laughs> I love Final <laughs> Fantasy 10s, but man, Mass Effect is so good and if you don't finish it, you're going to regret it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Mass Effect <laughs> is a trilogy totally there. Mass Effect is a trilogy that's worth playing through all the way without playing something in between. Also. Agreed. Because the yeah. games are short enough, right? But like, oh, oh yeah. I'm so jealous that you've never been spoiled on Mass Effect. Yeah, I was, I was going to say. No, I know nothing oh, about Mass Effect at all. And uh, every installment is something completely new to me. Yeah, I was going to say, no so no rare. spoilers. But, you know, after you finish Mass Effect 2, you're going to want to go straight into Mass straight Effect. Straight into Mass Effect 3. 3. Yeah. Okay. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I'm like, that's honestly like, a, like I I can't say I wasn't spoiled on, on like Mass Effect because like I was. I was following it while it was a brand new game when it was debuting mm-hmm. on the Xbox 360 and stuff like that. But I did not own a 360, so I did not have an urge to actually go out and play the game. And, you know, I had a lot of peer pressure. Like, people were literally trying to get me to drop $400 to buy a 360. <laughs> <laughs> they were tr- they were trying just for me to play, just for me to play, at that point, two games. Because the third game had, it hadn't even come out yet. Um, yeah. So by the time the entire, the original trilogy uh, came out, I'm a PS3 owner. And... And EA decides to drop the entire Mass Effect trilogy on PlayStation Three and stuff like that. So I went out, spent sixty dollars, bought bought that bought that entire like 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 collection, and played it. And I'm telling you, like it, I feel like I feel like the joy of 
experience Mass Effect now is being able to play every game is back to back. You finish Mass Effect one, go straight to Mass Effect two because Mass Effect two hits you like a freaking freight train <laughs> <laughs> after you press start. And then Mass Effect three is like, you know what? We're going to we're going to take everything you care about and we're going to make you feel it even more. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't wait. I cannot wait. I'm glad I yeah. can talk to professionals about this. I'll make sure that I'm not <laughs> we're professionals. Oh, my you God. You talk to professionals, a.k.a. people, old people who played it. Yeah, I I hated Mass Effect One the first time I played it back in like 2007 Mm -hmm. or 2000. I hated it. Yeah. What were your complaints? I just I I I think I think I expected it to be a shooter, and Mm -hmm. Mass Effect One is not really a shooter. It's an RPG, and then they get more like shooters as the series goes along. They kind of tone down the RPG stuff and make it a better shooter. And I was expecting it to just be like, like Halo with RPG stats. And it was not. And I think that's why I didn't like it. Yeah. If it wasn't for friends, like pushing me to play Mass Effect one, because uh, Mass Effect one came out in, in, in a, in a time when like, I just was not playing RPGs anymore. I feel like, I feel like the RPG formula had gotten so stale. And it's, and it's because like my heyday of gaming was PS one, PS two. And anyone that knows anything about PS1, PS2, like it was just like it it's it's a haven slash graveyard for JRPGs and just RPGs in general and stuff like that. So like I was RPG'd out and I was like, man, there's no way, there's no way I'm gonna play any more RPGs. And when I heard Mass Effect was out and Mass Effect was an RPG to play like an action game, I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't do it. And so yeah, when I actually played the trilogy, if it wasn't for the fact that people were actually pushing me to keep on, I was like, man, like I I I'm just gonna take my time. Like, no, play it, play it, play it. And you know, like beating it beating mass effect one paid off though it paid off mm-hmm. tremendously. I, don't think, I don't think i would have like played through the trilogy or started the trilogy if i weren't if i wasn't trying to impress a girl but hey, definitely no, that's that as good my, a motivation that was as my that. motivation to boot up mass effect one and i'm, I'm yeah that decision there you go i've done look i've done worse things to impress women so it's, yeah uh... <laughs> <laughs> i know playing a game for 60 hours that's that that's tame yeah yeah <laughs> Oh no! Ah, uh, oh, no. one of the greatest. <laughs> need to play of one of the time. best trilogies of all time. Whatever oh. will I do? It, it is a win-win <laughs> situation for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First of all, trying to impress a girl that plays games. Where were those when I was? You know. Yeah. Your age, but that's a, <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. Different story. <laughs> for for a different day and maybe another show, perhaps. Uh, yeah. Another topic. Yeah. LeRon, what are you playing? Um, I'm I'm back on I'm back on my bullshit. <laughs> Monster Hunter <Goodbye>. Tekken. <laughs> uh no Monster Hunter, no Monster Hunter this past week. Uh Tekken 8 for sure. I'm back in the Dead Space remake because uh because I'm not sure if it's been announced yet, but I'm gonna be on an upcoming book club for uh, for Boss Rush. And yeah, uh, Dead Space. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, dead okay. yep, yeah, Dead Space remake. I'm trying to I'm trying to finish it so I can see like the uh see the exclusive ending. Um mm. Mm. Um. Yeah, and uh, and I spent some time. I spent some time on um on uh on Tsushima. Good game. Um, is it is a good game? I'm taking my time on it because like I'm really trying to enjoy it. And you know what's and you know what's what's crazy for me is um is um Dave, you already know. Like I like I used to run a I used to run a PlayStation podcast. Like my co-host used to ridicule me because like I had never played Ghost of Tsushima while mm. when it was a brand new game. Who Austin? Austin, Stoy, Andre, right. <laughs> Any, anyone who's had it on that show too. over the. It's a good game. It's a really good game. Oh, it is. Oh, it is a good game. I'm enjoying yeah. it. But uh, but I and I actually and I actually tried to play it um on PS5, but I but I was playing the um I was playing the the, the free copy you got being a member for PlayStation Plus and stuff like that, which is not a bad which is not a bad way to play it. In all honesty, but I'm so much more of a PC gamer in this day and age and stuff like that. So like I didn't really get excited until like Sony just kind of like just said, oh it's coming on PC. Oh it'll be out next month on PC. I was like what. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, Ghost of Shima. I'm, I'm taking my time. Like, I, I'm not really a completionist, but I am one of those people because it's open world. I will find myself in like the wrong, the wrong part of the map, just like, just like getting random stuff and you know, like getting, getting objectives done and collecting shit. So, yeah. Mm. Nice. That's a that's a good approach for Ghost of Tsushima because like you can get burned out on those open world games if you go too hard on them. So, 
good to uh good to take your time just like just breathe that in because it's one of the prettiest games i've ever played you just want to like kind of just stop and look at the look at the plants sometimes yeah yeah i mean yeah and um and and i mean it's whether you're playing were you playing on the ps5 or, or well if you're playing on the ps4 or ps5 or on the pc like you know like the environments and just like the just like the the look of the game is just it's amazing and stuff like that and of course if you're like one of those extremists you play on kurosawa mode with like straight like you know straight japanese dialogue and stuff you know like yeah like you're in it <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah so it's a cool. it's a good time but yeah like yeah. like tekken 8 like like uh like you, you already know fighting game like there's some new content and stuff like that hey hachi's coming back to the game you know yeah how do you feel about that some people are uh not some people are really well, jaded, but uh, but the majority of the well, I I, I honestly understand because you know like I because like I'm a Tekken player. I've been playing Tekken since Tekken Two came out, and and like you know it always felt like Heihachi was like the bad guy, and then Tekken Seven uh, Tekken Seven basically fleshed out the motivations of Heihachi, and you come to find out that he wasn't the villain of this of the entire story and stuff like that. You know, he gets he gets killed in Tekken Seven. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, like, and, and, you know, it feels like, it feels like, it feels like the end, of, not just the end of an era, but the, but it feels like the end of a long running joke because like, Hey, Hachi's, they, they tend to kill he- Hey, Hachi twice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so like, so like when he, so like when his ending happens in Tekken seven, everybody is like, okay, now we can move on and we can like get the story, you know, finish the story now. So Tekken eight comes out. And there's no Heihachi in the roster and stuff like that, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, after after you know, like the season contents, like this is getting fleshed out. Like he's the next character for the for the first season pass. Like there's three, yeah, there's three, Eddie, Lydia, Heihachi. There's four characters coming for the season pass and stuff like that. Two of them are already out. A Heihachi's the new one, and everyone feels, and a lot of people feel very, 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 very jaded because you know, like. It was said he's dead. He's not coming back and all this stuff. Now I'm not sure if I'm not sure if that was ever the thing, but you know, with the uh, interviews of Harada, the executive producer and director for Tekken, he said he said yes. He, he says he understands where everybody came from about how they feel about it and stuff like that. But also with the fact that you know there were people out there that really wanted Heihachi back. You know he had to he had to pay attention to that. Hmm. Yeah. It, so is so, this yeah. a uh, is this a break glass for emergencies type thing? You know what? I it's feel like doing bad. Okay, so you know that's it's funny you say that because Tekken is actually the game. Tekken is actually the game that actually held up Namco uh, Bandai Namco's year last year. Bandai Namco Bandai Namco did did report that they are in the slump. Like they did not. I think I think they were forty percent under like their what they wanted what they wanted to project for uh, for monetary gain for last year and stuff like that. And Tekken was the only thing that was really leading it. Of course, like when Dragon Ball Z comes out, you know, like Sparking Zero, like that's going to give them a nice little push, you know, stuff like that. But Tekken Tekken did start floundering after it came out because there's there's all sorts of little controversies going on with it. People don't like the fact that a season pass was introduced after after people got wooed into buying the game. You know, um, people also didn't like the fact that, you know, like, um, like, you know, like other things are going on, like uh, the way the way they're announcing, like, like their bonus characters, because, you know, like every season, every season pass for Tekken always introduce new character, you know, either bring introduce new characters or bring back old characters from the, from the previous games and stuff like that. Nobody's really digging the way it's done because, like, you know, for example, Street Fighter, you know, like before, uh, like a couple weeks before Evo happened, Street Fighter just announced, hey, this is who you're getting when the next season pass comes out. Bison, Terry Bogard, My Shiranui, and all that stuff. Like, you're getting, and, and, and Elena, and like a, a grown up version of Elena and stuff like that. Everyone knew exactly what they were getting off the bat. But, but with Tekken, it was like drip content because, okay, yeah, Eddie's coming, you know, a few months go by. Oh, here comes Lydia, you know. Evo happens. Hey, Hachi gets announced. And now we're like, who's the fourth character and stuff like that. So, you know, it's a love hate relationship with Tekken right now. And also, also Tekken, Tekken eight just is, it feels like a different convention on, on Tekken. It's still a fighting game as core and stuff like that, but it's, it feels like you no longer have to be strategic in your gameplay for it. And what I mean is like people who are just like crazy, just nutty people are like the mash buttons and stuff like that. Like the game favors those people. Mm. Like I was playing Tekken. I was playing Tekken literally, uh, literally like twenty minutes before we we actually recorded tonight. And I swear to God, like I was running into people that all they were literally doing was hitting buttons. But of course, like I'm the fool because I'm falling for this stuff. I, I should just be patient and like and like defend, you know. 
you know, but it's hard when you're used to like waiting your turn, but it seems like you never get your turn. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I just, you know, I think I think Tekken's I think Tekken's doing all right. If if there's one thing I've learned, if there's one thing I've learned in like my long storied career playing video games is people are always going to find something to bitch and moan about. They are. What? They are. They are. It doesn't matter. Your game, your game could literally be perfect. I like, like for example, like Hades. Hades won a lot of Game of the Year awards, you know, a couple years back and stuff like that. And people were bitching about that. People were like, "Who hard is the souls like?" Or, or, uh, or why does the guy have to be so sexy? You know, dumb shit like that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I like if I'm like if you don't like looking at pretty people, don't play the fucking game. <laughs> I, I mean, I like looking at pretty people. I like looking at pretty people. I don't care if the men, I don't care if the men or women. I, I like looking at pretty people. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> why they're called attractive. I don't know. Just whatever. <laughs> Look, man. Okay. Uh, as for me, I'm going to go next. I, yeah, assume, go. I assume you're done. I'm done. Yeah, I was done. <laughs> I mean, you uh, look at the dock. If it doesn't have a stri- if, it, if it doesn't have a strike through, that's what we want to talk about. I wasn't I wasn't looking at the dock. I was, that, see, that's your fault then. I, I <laughs> look, man. There's 47 things going on at all times. Okay, I'm just trying to <laughs> keep her, all the ducks in a row. Okay. Hey, you're doing good. You took your meds today, didn't you? You're doing good. Me? Oh yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you, man. Ever since ever since they like redid the prescription of this medication, I feel great. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's good. I mean, oh, yeah, that's good. You know. That's good. Uh, my my um my uh my uh my assigned my assigned caregiver like put me on Adderall mm. and uh, it's it's interesting. Isn't it great? Yeah, <laughs> I feel weird. Uh, OK, so so technically it is a controlled substance. You're not uh, I'm aware to, they my you're not supposed to tells me that every time I pick it up. You're not supposed to operate heavy machinery, but every now and then, because of my work, I do have to get into get into a car and drive, and it's an interesting experience driving. <laughs> just, just, you know, never mind. Uh, <laughs> I take I take one I take one every day before I drive thirty five minutes to work. So, oh, you're oh you take it daily because my doctor my doctor tried to tell me to take it daily. Uh, well, and I was like, to, I'm supposed to take it quote as needed. Yeah, but I was like, as needed also, but but I was also told from my first prescri- prescription, take take it every day until that prescription runs out. And then when you get it filled, then start taking it as needed. And I'm like, wait, I, I'm i 49 years old. At this point, I'm well adjusted with my attention deficit disorder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, look at us. Yeah, actually, take a actually, the next actually, the next time I'm playing, I'm playing like some some second sessions. I need to take my Adderall to mm-hmm. see what happens. Yeah. You're gonna win. I might, I might rank up. <laughs> you might win. <laughs> <laughs> what's your, uh, what's your current rank in Tekken? Um, I'm, uh, I'm 21st Dan in, um, in, in online ranking. So that's uh, Fujin. So yeah, like I mean, I'm basically in the part where like you know, like know your shit, or you're gonna get your ass whooped. Yeah. Like there's no more, there's no more like feeling your way through it at, at that point and stuff like that. Because there was like a stark, there was like a stark difference in like, and yeah, they talk. Like there's talk all over, especially in, it, well in fighting games in general about being hard stuck, and yeah, like I felt like I was hard stuck for a while in like um in like purple rank, um, mm. uh, but once I got into blue rank, I was like, oh, this is a whole different ball of wax. Like I've been demoted a couple of times and had to fight my way back to my original rank. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, uh, but it's fun. It's fun. It, it, it can be frustrating, but um. I'm not hardcore enough in fighting games because like a lot of people like, you know, fighting, you know, like people who are going on the esports and the tournament circuit and stuff like that, like like video games become your second job because like you're trying to win money. You're trying to you're trying to get the notoriety and stuff like that. You're trying to get grand titles and stuff like that. I'm never going to be that way. But also I kind of take gaming a little seriously to the point where like I like there are literally days when I'm playing tech and I'm like, man, I'm. My blood is boiling. It's time to turn this shit off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. Been there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as for me, not really anything new to talk about. I've been playing Ocarina of Time for book club. Uh, man, just flying through, getting the shield, getting the sword, going through the the Great Dooku Tree is like a, it's like a, it's like a one hour run, if that, at this point for me. Mm-hmm. I've 
even though I've only completed Ocarina of Time once, I think maybe running through the, the DQ tree is like, I've probably done it probably 15 times at this point. Uh, I swear that I hear the way I hear you people talk about it. It, it, it feels like it feels, it sounds like it's a, a, a Vietnam for you guys. Is, is that about uh, right? What? The Deku tree, all that, not the, not the Deku tree. Maybe, maybe the water temple for little kids playing it back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> maybe the bottom of the well, something yeah. like that. That's why I got a, that's why I got a guide. Okay. Fine. Yeah, I I, I I desperately need guides for video games to this day. Man, let me tell oh, you, I use guides all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah, like <laughs> I've, if I've I'm not if I'm not if I'm not using if I'm not using a guide at this point, I'm not really taking the game seriously. Yeah, yeah, got, I feel like if I didn't have a guide, I would not like the Dark Souls trilogy as much as I do now. Oh yeah, don't even get me started. Like that's part of the <laughs> experience. With that this. is part of the experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, I've gotten this. Speaking of guides, gotten in this kind of like uh, this groove or this mindset of like collecting physical strategy guides again Mm -hmm. for like older games. Let me tell you. It's an expensive hobby at this point. Yeah, they're Uh, beautiful, though. I have the the big era and then slowly watched it die out. The physical strategy book thing. Yeah. Yeah. I have a I recently got the big strategy book for Morrowind, which was one of my favorites from back in the day. And that was another one where like I would play that with that book open with, you know, because it's such a for then it was like easily the most dense, complicated game I'd ever played. Yeah, man, Morrowind, what a what a revolution on the Xbox. Oh, yeah. So I've been playing Ocarina of Time, playing, making my way through uh, Destiny. The Act 2 of Episode Echoes has ended. The big reveal of who the conductor is <laughs> happened. <laughs> and um, it's... Is it is it you? No. Are you the conductor? No. Is it, is it anybody we should care about? It's well, Maya I mean, Sunderesh. I don't, I, I don't play... I don't play Destiny, so I don't yeah, know I don't, who I don't play Destiny, is. but yeah, just, just a <laughs> shot in the dark. No. Uh, <laughs> quick 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 lore piece on Maya Sundresh, everybody. Uh an old an old bounty hunter slash vex scientist who ha- became obsessed with making copies of herself. And um she has made somewhere in the realm of 220 copies of herself. And the conductor is Maya Sundresh Prime, I guess you would say. Mm. They don't call it that, but, um, you know, anyways, uh, and yeah, she's controlling a rogue network of, of Vex robots. So that's kind of the whole premise of the episode, uh, going on right now. Okay. Um, I know, I know some people who say destiny two is a second job that you pay for. Yeah. (laughs) You you, sounds about right. You do pay for it. Um, (laughs) yes, money, a lot of money is involved. (laughs) Yeah, especially if yeah. you want the uh, the Mass Effect skins uh, for your characters. Ooh. Mass Effect skins. OK, yeah. I guess There's it's time a, to hop on Destiny 2. I'm flying the Normandy as my spaceship. What? Yep. I am so fucking jealous. Uh, the Alliance Cruiser, which kind of looks like a Mako without wheels, is my <laughs> Sparrow. And wow. my armor set is the Shepard N7 armor. On my nice. Titan. Sorry, I remember now. This is the thing that Mass Effect fans were so upset about because, like, this was not this was not anything that was that was mm-hmm. Mass Effect. Yeah, because they announced them. it on N7 Day, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then my Warlock is has the Shadow Broker, uh, Liara set. Nice. Say what? Now? Yeah. That's uh, so interesting. I think I think the Hunters have Garrus's armor set but i'm not 100 percent sure because i don't like hunters and well that collab does make sense though yeah it's the one that it's the one that makes sense the witcher and god of war don't make sense ghostbusters doesn't make sense yeah Ma- mass effect, effect makes sense yeah mass effect makes sense uh i've also been playing more teenage mutant ninja turtle splintered fate which um i am addicted to it <laughs> so okay here's the thing i hate roguelikes I hate them. I'm treating this as an alternative to an arcade game. <laughs> Just how I talked myself into keeping them to play it. <laughs> um, the combat is really good. 
in this game. Mm. It's like it's doing something really unique that Turtles has not done in, in ever really. Um, I've mostly been playing as Leonardo, to, although I've made a run with each turtle. Uh, I think Raph is my least favorite. Raph is kind of like an up close brawler type character and like least favorite in the game. Yeah, in the game. Well, Raph is always like a, a close I know. brawler, if we're being honest. I know, but that like stats actually matter in this game. I feel like in Rotolikes, I'd always prefer more longer range because yeah. it's like yeah. you get overwhelmed really quickly. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of why I like Leonardo, because he's kind of like an all around kind of character. He has the shurikens that you can throw as like a range. You can get up close with your with your katanas you can mm. do a cool dash move that uh you can kind of unlock damage uh abilities through your dash move um so i kind of i really like leonardo donatello is like the long me- the long range melee character obviously with the bow staff and then yeah michelangelo actually has a lot of speed and actually can have a lot of range if you unlock the right uh pieces um, but he also dies the fastest. So, uh, you know, his life bar is not very um, his, his defense. <laughs> his defense needs boosted uh, real bad. Uh, but I am really enjoying it. I think the this is the 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 characters are my favorite turtles design since probably the original movie. In my opinion, they, they are nice. ba- like. I love the way they look in this. Uh, it's like a mix between, I would say, like the twenty th- or the two thousand one cartoon, three cartoon, whenever they put it on Fox Kids or whatever that was. Two thousand three. Yeah, uh, and then mixed with like has hints of the Michael Bay movies, but not like awful. You know, they have like, <laughs> you know, they have like, they have like taped hands and. Donatello has like the ma- the goggles and like, you know, they yeah. all have like little things that stick out about their personality without like being stupid looking, I guess. Uh, but April is cool. She's there to like kind of give you little bits of the story. Splinter, you turn in dragon coins to upgrade your abilities with Splinter, who uh, like this whole the whole story kind of revolves around Splinter was has been uh kidnapped by the shredder and you're jumping through these different uh dimensions to try to find him and uh you know he kind of helps you upgrade through like uh if you've seen the original movie when they're all sitting around the campfire and he kind of shows up as like a like a force ghost almost in the flames and uh he kind of shows up like that to help you upgrade your turtles permanently and then each run has temporary upgrades uh that you can have so I'm really enjoying it. The boss battles are cool. I've I've fought Leatherhead and I fought a giant a giant Mauser, which was weird. Uh, I have uh, I fought a boss that I, I don't recognize, which is weird for me because I'm like a huge Turtles fan and I just don't recognize this character. Um, and so I've been play I've been doing like a run before bed every night, and it's just it's really great. I highly That's recommend a, it. Yeah. If, if you have a Switch or Apple Arcade, or I don't know if it's on PC or not, um, but I assume it's coming. If it's not on PC already, it will be there at some point. And uh, I recommend it, uh, even if you don't like roguelikes. Uh, it kind of has that same feeling I had with Dead Cells, but even more so, which like, it's just so fun to play that I don't really care that it's a roguelike. Um, I did put dead cells down after, you know, like five or six hours because I just got tired of starting over. But uh, <laughs> this progression feels more. It feels more solidified than dead cells did, I guess I would say. So really, really, really great ver- a ra- a great story, great version of the Ninja Turtles. Uh, so nice uh i also saw deadpool and wolverine this weekend we can talk about that actually yeah i feel like i have a i have a good opinion on that movie i think it was amazing yeah i think it was awesome i no spoilers though because Laurent hasn't seen it yet no spoilers no yeah i'm I'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry i'm lame no worries no worries i didn't didn't, didn't expect too many but the movie's still new 
I feel like just in case I wouldn't want to get into any spoilers openly until like a couple of weeks from now. Yeah, we're yeah. we're gonna do a spoiler cast at some point once Laurent. Yeah, I, I plan to watch it. I plan to watch it real soon so I can be in a spoiler cast uh, with you, Corey. Uh, like my my main my main reason is holding me back is uh is I need to rewatch the second Deadpool because like the first time I watched it I wasn't I didn't really like it and I, so like it kind of it kind of soured it kind of soured my feel on the on the franchise by that uh, by this point. I so I actually rewatched the first two movies recently. And like the first one is is really good. The second one is kind of like it's just OK. I like the idea of the second movie, but like it just I don't know. There are parts that work and parts that don't for me. But the third movie was like. Like I said before, like the I got that feeling that everybody got once the last Spider-Man movie came out. That was this was my Spider-Man moment of like, oh, my gosh, like I love the 90s X-Men cartoon. I you know, for better, or for worse, love the Fox <laughs> Marvel movies growing up. Yeah. Like, yeah. uh, I was definitely, I was definitely for both of them. For, I think when in the theater for the Spider Man movie mm-hmm. with the whole, with all the different Spider Men, like everyone erupted, they got off their seats, popcorn was flying, people were clapping and cheering, right? But for this screening, I got at least for the Deadpool Wolverine movie, uh, certain scenes no one really like kind of, reacted to a lot i feel like i i there are parts where i would just stand up and cheer myself expecting the whole everyone else in the theater to like give the same reaction but i guess there just aren't as many x-men dedicated x-men fans out there (sighs) they're the worst i know (laughs) man x-men though man i i gotta say without spoiling anything the moment in the last 10 minutes and that moment when they're back oh Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. ah, the slow mo, yeah. Oh, oh, I, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so good. It is uh, really good. If you want to see how you can become a Patreon producer, head on over to patreoncom Rush network The Patreon producers for this month are Adriel Munger, Austin Campbell, Celeste Roberts, Christian S, Sana Dierig, Francisco Santilan. Matthew Keel, and Todd Oxtra. Thanks for your continued support of the Boss Rush Network. Speaking of good, we have a we have a lot to get through in the next you know little bit. So uh, we were going to do a week our our normal weekly segment, but something happened today as of the day of this recording that uh, kind of pissed a lot of people off. Me included, uh, being a fan of this game and this company. Uh, we're going to talk about the Bungie layoffs today. Uh, <laughs> so we're recording this on Wednesday, July 31st. So you will hear this on August 5th, I think is Monday. Bungie laid off 220 people today uh, with no uh, notice. Uh, this came from a letter on Bungie.net. Uh, from Pete Parsons, the CEO, uh, they they reduce staff reduce staff by seventeen percent. They uh, not only did they lay off two hundred twenty people, but they are integrating one hundred and fifty five other employees into Sony Interactive Entertainment proper, which means uh, they will be losing close to four hundred people from the studio. Um, this was. I, so as someone who pays a lot of attention to the debt and obviously ingrained in the destiny community and pays attention to Bungie, this, this, we knew layoffs were coming since the last round of layoffs, because it has been talked about quite a bit in the community that people were going to be laid off. Uh, it was not known that it was going to be this bad again, uh, especially because they laid off, 108 people the last time I think was the number Mm -hmm. and uh, you know this just continues the trend of a lot of developers just laying off staff to to um, essentially Essentially. save themselves right and um, this this goes for Bungie's leadership to 
because if they don't hit a certain financial mark, uh, the leadership board gets taken over by Sony and by PlayStation Studios, and then Bungie will no longer be a quote unquote independent studio as part of Sony. They will not then be a PlayStation Studio, you know, along with with the rest of the roster that Sony has. And so a lot of this was believed to have been done to uh, avoid that situation. Uh, And it sucks because last time it was understandable to an extent where like Lightfall wasn't very good. The player base lost interest. Uh, They missed revenue marks by 40%. Uh, And so layoffs were inevitable, I think, at that point when you miss your, you know, (laughs) yearly revenue mark by 40%, that closes most studios. Uh, But the final shape is their most successful expansion since Forsaken. And uh, they have touted as much since then. And to lay off this many people, and I know people at Bungie who got laid off, and I reached out to some of them I haven't heard back from them. I wanted to see if they would comment and, uh, you know, even if it's anonymous to kind of talk about and nobody's kind of, I mean, obviously they're probably staying off because this is just such a hurtful, you know, thing going on, but it's seeing this really sucks. And it's, it's not just them like armor studios laid off a bunch of people today too, which is a kind of like a smaller single a, indie studio publisher like man layoffs they, they're just not stopping um so i kind of are these uh are these freelancers being laid off or nope these are all contract full-time. employees yeah these, these are, are these full-time are... employees uh yeah wow. the verge kind of came out later and kind of they they dug through and it was a lot of uh qa people a lot of merchandising people a lot of um you know, some executives, but not many, even though they said it would, it affected every level of the company um, and some developers, uh, but they were all, none of them were contracted. They were all full-time employees. Wow. So the just... thing that like, especially sucked about this one and like, they all suck and it's just like a never ending just repeat cycle of like, you know, you see the news about layoffs, you, you feel for the people who got laid off. You Mm -hmm. are angry at the people who over projected, or that's something they said in the, uh, the, the bungee thing is like, we, we were overly ambitious and the, we, the company's in the red and it's like, well, whose fucking fault is that? It's not the people that got laid off, but you know, so we, we're in this constant cycle of being like the people who caused this are not the people who, you know, are affected by this really. Uh, and then they had the nerve. This, this really pissed me off. They had the nerve in their release about the layoffs to, I don't know if they're trying to be subtle about it, but they, they transitioned like talking about the layoffs, talking about why it happened and then transitioned into, please be excited about the new action adventure game that we're developing. Mm-hmm. And that was like, Hey, can you just like announce that later? Like, can you at least act like, the most important thing you're announcing is that 220 people lost their jobs. Yeah. And that, but that's, that's Pete Parsons for you. And he, I mean, he's been an executive at Bungie since almost the beginning. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, he's their CEO now and he just doesn't want to give up that spot, which is like, okay. But like, like you said, not even, you're starting to promote your new game in a layoff press release. Like yeah, exactly. <laughs> what are you doing? Like read yeah. the room guy. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. If you've been an executive for this long, then you should know that it's going to suck to lay people off and it's going to suck to have to put this announcement out there and face the backlash, which he went private on Twitter because he didn't want to face the backlash. Yeah. Um, so all shout out did. to him once again for not, you know, owning up to what's going on here. Yeah. yeah. And then, mature too. Yeah. Especially since and, this just happened eight months ago. <laughs> yeah. 
So, but then, yeah, like, like you said, like if you've been an executive for this long, then like, couldn't, couldn't you, or did they lay off the PR people who would be like, maybe don't try to announce a new game in the layoff <laughs> announcement. They, they yeah. actually did lay off yeah. their PR okay, department well, there we go. and they're yeah. going through Uber strategists now. There Which, we go. Shout out to CJ from Uber strategists. He's a nice guy. Get emails from <laughs> think, him every day. I think what really sucks is the fact that they're so throwable. Like developers, people who brought, who gave Bungie such good projects like this are just seen as like disposable. That's what's like really heartbreaking. Because to me, I think video game is a form of art. And there are some video games out there that deserve to be framed and put into a museum somewhere, right? Which also directly makes the developers artists in a way, mm -hmm. right? And so you have these, you know, uh, developers, developing studios, corporations like Bungie, uh, sort of like harvesting these developers, these these artists, quote unquote, uh, for their work, releasing it, and then seeing these people as oh, throw away. And these are like just the, putting them out the pasture. Mm -hmm. There, yeah. I got my water. This is the empty plastic bottle. Let's throw it in the trash. You know, recycle mm -hmm. it for other people, other developers. And it, that's what's like really, it's like it's such a depressing thing to know about the industry. Like I love the games. We all love games. But knowing that this is a product of like unfairness in the industry and like uh the whole developers themselves not being respected enough that's just like that's a bad thought to have in the back of your head mm -hmm. yeah it's just it's yet another example of how art and like corporations are fundamentally incompatible it's just you can't they they can't mix there's always yeah. going to be that clash mm -hmm. yeah and it really it really sucks to see something like this happen at some at a developer like like Bungie, especially because they've always been like projected themselves as community first, developer first. The developers care about the games they're making. I mean, you look at the Halo, the original Halo trilogy, you look at, you know, the old marathon games. You I mean, you even look at something like Oni, right? Like, I mean, that game's not very good, but like there are still people at Bungie that worked on Oni and defend it and you know they're proud of it and it's like you know these these developers at Bungie are so proud of Destiny and especially especially right now right I mean look at all the positivity around Destiny and the final shape you know I mean LeBron how, how many times have you made fun of me for like Oh, the final shape's probably it for me. I just want to see how it ends to me being like, oh my God, I need to see what happens next. Okay, okay, okay. So 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 real quickly here, man. Like, like for for people who are new out here and are this is their very first episode of the Boss First Podcast. Uh, first of all, thank you. Welcome. We we hope to see oh. more of you. <laughs> uh for months, for months, Corey was like, Man, I just cannot wait for the final shape to come out because uh, I'm done as soon as it comes out. I, I, that was his level of commitment and stuff like that and then <laughs> and then for like the next three weeks straight like it was the only thing you could fucking talk about and you know it's like it's like man like this guy this guy's this guy sounds like me when a new monster hunter game comes out except i've never said i'm gonna quit monster hunter <laughs> yeah uh no 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 but in all honesty i am so glad that i'm so glad that a franchise you love is able to like reinvigorate your or, or bring you back to life and stuff like that because we hate to see it like we just had we just had a conversation about tekken and like how the um and how the community is feeling about that game and stuff like that and it feels like it, and honestly if you hear like the majority well i, I feel like the, the negative people are always the ones that speak the loudest they're, they're always the ones you hear first and stuff like that i'm enjoying tekken i've gotten used to like the like the changes and stuff when tekken and stuff like that like you know, if we're going to go with my favorite franchise, Monster Hunter, for example, like I feel like Monster Hunter Try on the Wii was like the weakest edition. And that was the one I played. I, I want to say maybe I played like that game's lucky if you got 200 hours out of me where other Monster Hunter games have gotten over a thousand hours out of me. Wow. Yeah, like I play I play that game. I play that game just as hardcore as people play World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy 14, um, Destiny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but yeah, uh, this whole this whole thing, like uh, it, it's it we we kind of knew it was coming, but we were also we, but we're still surprised when it happened. In, in all seriousness, mm -hmm. because I thought with the I thought with the way the final shape 
you know, like how how it rolled out. I was like, hey, this can be this can be their stay of execution. But the fact they still had to, that he still wound up laying off all these people and stuff like that. Once again, I always feel like I'm the person on the on the Boss Rush podcast is always the most vocal about layoffs and and you know people people getting blindsided and stuff like that because in my in, in my working career I've been laid off from I've been laid off from a very good job an engineering job and that shit sucked wow. that shit sucked you know and it was because it was because they overhired <laughs> they overhired and yep uh, two years later I don't have a, I don't have that job anymore that job that was honestly going to be what set me up and I would have retired with it you know um, so yeah I feel like I'm vocal because I I I've put my skin in the game and something similar to that and, and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, going back to the whole, like, you know, like these people are basically artists, like, you know, like stuff like that. Like, how do you, how do you, how can you justify staying in your career? If, if, if the industry is this fickle, you know, and, and let's look at it for what it is. None of these damn execs and CEOs are taking pay cuts unless they're unless you're in Japan and, and, and work for Nintendo. You know, <laughs> those are about the only ones. You know, we don't see we don't see this shit happening in the UK. We don't see this shit happening in Eurasia. We don't see it happens in North or South or South America. You know, like you know, like it always. You know, like yeah, like we're gonna just bleed. We're just gonna bleed out like all of our talent and then we're gonna be like woe is me we can't make any good games like that's what e- that's what happened to ea and activision a, a while back <laughs> we yeah, don't have was, any talent to make these games <laughs> yeah i was gonna say like i don't wish this because obviously i want good games to come out and i want i want Corey here to keep enjoying destiny for the rest of his life mm-hmm. but this is what happens like you know these these companies they they overshoot they overhire they fire people and then they're like we 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 lost all of this, you know, this knowledge, basically. Mm -hmm, The people who were instrumental in using the knowledge they had to, like you said, turn around Destiny from one expansion to the next, a lot of those people are probably gone now and they're going to have to either teach new people how to do it or worse, they're going to make, you know, one person do the job of two people and hope that that works, which both of those options are not good for the art. Mm Mm-hmm. That's another thing that kind of infuriates me too, because we have all these HR departments talking about how retention is the fa- is the is the biggest way to lose money, you know, for a company and stuff like that. And like, I don't know, like, do these people not listen to the own words that the, that it's like the call is coming from inside the house, you know? <laughs> like, like if you can't listen to the people, they're they're there to make sure you keep making money, or you or you at least stay in stay in the black, you know? Like, why the hell are you there? Yeah. Right. Right. Especially yeah. because I think. Like, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. sorry. You go ahead. Oh, I was I was gonna say like especially because like when you're when you're speaking about Bungie like over the course of the last six months, before these in between layoffs, Joe Blackburn, their game director, left. Uh, Katarina Macedo left, who was their expansions director for the last four years. Um, you know. Michael Salvatore got laid off the, uh, during the last round, which is like a, he's like a legendary composer, mm-hmm. right? Right up there with uh, Marty McDonald. I mean, I know he's kind of a, a weirdo now, but like, uh, and not just legendary, like the like like right right before he got laid off, didn't he win an award mm-hmm. on the Game Awards? Mm-hmm. He won an award. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so, like, you have all these big names leaving the company before. The layoffs and it's like you know i mean you know there's just i mean their community people have all left like deej left damage left and i mean damage is back now but like you know liana rupert left uh well she got laid off and was like very vocal about being laid off and like it's just all these people christopher barrett got laid off who was you know the the at one point the game director of marathon uh which now we don't know what's going on with that uh, yeah, like that was the other thing too. Like I was when I read when I read the statement and stuff, I was like, "What's happening with Marathon?" Because I didn't I didn't see anything about that. Like all they want to talk about was Destiny, which mm-hmm. at the same time I get because Destiny is the only thing they've been fucking doing for the last like you, what what it, it's well, the only thing been going on for what like ten years. Destiny's been going on for what ten years? Okay, I was about to say eight. September September is the ten year anniversary. Yeah, wow. yeah, uh, yeah. It's just this is so 
crazy that all this it just continues to happen. And so I'm I looked up how there's a game industry layoff tracker <laughs> website. <Yeah. laughs> and um, in 2023, just over 11,000 people got laid off for the year. We are in June. And we are at 11,250 11, people, and that has not added the Bungie or the Armor Studios layoffs today. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been surpassed. So that would be a, a, around 1,150 or 11,500 people laid off. Yeah, could it, already. could it be the fact that these companies are throwing so much money at the games that they're producing by the time it's out and by the time it's released, they don't have enough in their pockets to really sustain the developers? Yeah, well, the, and if that the thing if that was the case, then why wouldn't they just like you know? Mm -hmm. hire more freelancers instead of like yeah the thing with the thing with that with bungie is that they overhired they drastically overhired because they had huge ambitions especially r when covid hit right they they bought an an old mall to build a new headquarters for bungie they were going to open a publishing arm in europe to publish games they created something like six to 10 incubation teams to create new franchises that, you know, is in part of this article, which is what that new game is that they spun out into a, you know, a new studio, which they can't handle that PlayStation is now going to take over. Um, and they wanted to run three, uh, three triple a franchises at one studio with multiple games and spinoff games and mobile games attached to all these franchises. The decision making in AAA gaming is so short sighted mm -hmm. that like these these things like they say these are unavoidable, but it's just because the people who are making the decisions are not thinking long term. You say like at the beginning of COVID, this is when like money was unlimited for gaming, right? Everyone mm -hmm. thought like, oh, gaming spiking. Okay, now it's time to spend a ton of money, hire a bunch of people, start mm -hmm. a bunch of projects. Yeah. And it's all like, it's all just short-sighted decision-making. And then we get to more short-sighted decision-making when it's like, oh, we're not going to meet our targets. We need to cut costs. Well, the way we cut costs the fastest is to lay people off. Yeah, like cutting, I don't feel like I, I, I've, I've, you know, like I'm, I, I, I have a partnership in the business that in the business that I work that I that I work at and stuff like that. And the only time, and and like it's not like we have like this crazy ass workforce, but you know, like it, but you know, like right now, like you know, like if well, let's say we weren't making like you know, like our 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 profit and stuff like that, you know, like we would like me and my partner will like re re strategize like our, like our marketing or like or like our pricing or how we push stuff. And we, you know, like, uh, like we would, we would never cut off the, the workforce unless the workforce is the real problem, you know? Yeah. But it's just, what can we do right now to make our numbers look better tomorrow? We can cut a bunch of people and yeah. ga games are such a weird product for like huge, you know, billion dollar companies because games take so long to actually see the return on what you're doing that yeah. the it feels worse when the decisions are so short sighted because like I, I forget what developer it was or what publisher recently like fired a bunch of people because games were taking too long. And it's like, what did you think was going to happen? Like <laughs> this stuff takes a long time. Wasn't that Microsoft that did that shit? It, it might have been Microsoft. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> it, I was I was going to joke earlier. You guys could just have like a weekly who gets laid off this week uh, segment on the podcast if you wanted yeah, to be we, super we, cynical uh, about it. We, could, we could, could do a bingo chart. Oh, we, yeah. we, we thought about that and then we we depressed ourselves. So we, yeah, it's, well, a, it's a very depressing way to yeah. run the show. But yeah. it's, uh, it's just, uh, I mean, games are such a weird product, right? And there, there's so much money that like I feel like people who don't understand the industry get into it because they think like, oh, gaming is where all the money is. So yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's we're gonna we're yeah. gonna follow it there. And like, not to say the CEO of Bungie doesn't understand the gaming industry, but like, it, it just these quick decisions they they're just heartless to you know the person who made the decision to put us in these positions is not going to feel the repercussions of it. Mm -hmm. It's the, like you said, people that work in merchandising who have no fucking involvement in 
these level of decisions, right? They're just going to work trying to do their job and go home. And now, now that's gone. Yeah. It's, um, I, I, I feel for everybody who got laid off today. I really do because like, yeah, I mean, if a game isn't successful, like you can kind of see it from a business perspective, but like the final shape was successful by all counts, right? Financially. Yeah. There's a there's a case with that with EA and Dead Space remake. Mm -hmm. It's they were in talks to do the Dead Space two remake, but you know because it didn't reach the sales didn't reach their expectations, that idea got scrapped unfortunately. Yeah. Because they didn't sell as many millions of copies as they had as they wanted to project it, and that like went below their expectations. (laughs) And that's just like it's crazy to think about because like you see Nintendo games like barely hitting the 1 million mark and then getting a sequel for them a couple years later. Whereas EA is like, Oh, this didn't make like this, this didn't reach 10 or 20 million. So we're going to scrap their sequel that we had in plan because they didn't like reach our expectations. So it's like a game could do so well, but then because of these like sort of like umbrella corporations, it's just like, it's not really going to go anywhere. Yeah. There's tons of examples across the industry of well-received games that, you know, they didn't sell 30 million copies, but they sold pretty well or they got like insanely good reviews Right, and it's not enough to make a good game. It's like as a, uh, someone working at some of these companies, if you do your job super well and you make a very good game, you are guaranteed nothing. Yep. Yeah. It's, um, it's not a, it's not a safe spot to be in for sure. No. It's, um, but I want to talk about the bright side about some of these layoffs real quick before I will not bright side, not not like a bright side, but like I'm being being sarcastic. I'm being sarcastic. (laughs) I think. I think with some of these layoffs. And as some of these larger corporate kind of publicly traded companies start falling apart. I think you're going to start seeing a lot of that double A space kind of grow with new studios and talent and create games that are budgeted, maybe budgeted correctly. Expectations are set correctly. You're going to see great, you know, leaders from these other studios. I think like, I think you look at, and and maybe Concord's a terrible, no terrible example, but you know, those are all people that left Xbox 343, Bungie, uh, EA, and they came together and they're like, we know how to make a shooter. Let's make a shooter. Let's make a shooter that we think will be satisfying. And from all accounts, Concord is fun to play. It's just the characters are kind of bland or boring. Uh, I haven't played it. I saw a trailer. I thought it looked kind of cool, but also I hate the dual shock, so I'm probably not going to play it. Um, but yeah, I, I just I think you're going to see a lot of these smaller studios pop up. And that, that was kind of a joke, by the way. We had a whole discussion last week on the DualShock <laughs> controller. Yeah, I know. That's why I haven't said anything. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> although that Concord one looks sick and the Astro Bot one. It does. Looks sick. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm tempted to buy that Concord controller just because I feel like the Concord is going to crash and burn. And like this is going to be the proof that the thing even yeah. existed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be one of those things where Sony's investing in something that's not really going to turn out well for them. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. <sighs> We have Overwatch other, at home. I think that's the other thing too. Like, uh, like, like you know, like all these companies are on like kind of like the back foot because like they were they were tr- they were chasing a trend that was popular at the time, mm-hmm. um, but they didn't realize the, the development time that it took for it. For example, let's look at yeah. Suicide Squad. Hopefully, everybody got their free copy of Suicide Squad, killed the Justice League. You know, like when it, when Amazon was like, here, have it. You know. <laughs> Yeah. uh yeah because i think the servers are coming down real soon anyway uh but i think they're supposed to i think they're supposed to deprecate it down to where like it can be at least a single player game you know i think i think that was the plan for it i'm not sure though don't, don't quote me on that one there's a rumor um, that they're gonna do an, a quote-unquote offline mode yeah yeah that that part well i think that was the other thing that kind of screwed them too because like they they put it on always online clause into their game which i'm like i'm like if you don't want to get any sales like tell people that you have to have an internet connection to play the game like you will not get if, if it's not traditionally a game that you need an online connection for you know what i mean like you know mm-hmm. like for example i know 
well, I mean, I probably would have bought Tekken 8, you know, uh, regardless. But if they turn around and said Tekken 8, like, you you always need to have an always online presence, I probably would be like, nope. <laughs> I know I know a lot of people have been like, nope. This is a fighting game. What the hell are y'all talking yeah. about? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I don't, I don't know if there's anything else productive we can say about this topic. It just, it just really sucks. And I feel for all the people out there who lost their jobs. I hope everybody lands Mm -hmm. on their feet. I saw a bunch of companies tweet out, Hey, we're hiring, uh, apply for our jobs. Like, uh, I know a lot of Xbox studios did today. Because they know that's some, that's some talent. This is Bungie we're talking about. This is some talent. Yeah. 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 EA, 343. Um, a lot of, a lot of shooter companies were tweeting out, uh, stuff today. Remedy so. also. Yes. I remember them. Yep. Uh, yeah. I think even Treyarch and, and infinity ward were, were tweeting out like they were hiring for their projects. So, uh, I hope everybody affected find something. Um, it really sucks. Yep. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next topic. Shall we? Um, I lost the doc. Laurent, what's our next topic? Um, our next topic is uh, we're, we're rolling into our banter of the week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, always, as always, head over to BossRush.net um, and check out. We actually have a feature section for all of our BossRush banters and stuff like that. So just head over to the website. The website has been newly reconstructed and redone and stuff like that. So uh, kudos to kudos to the behind the scenes team that was on that. And by the behind the scene, heat scenes team, I mean, Corey. No, they all suck. It's all broken. <laughs> Yeah. So uh so this week's Bossers banter uh hang on cuz uh I'm having a hard time pulling it up. Okay, so so this one is from uh, Ju- uh Julie Young, Yang or Young. I'm I I didn't quite get I it's 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 kind of weird sometimes how like Y A N G is pronounced and stuff like that. So I'm sorry in advance if I butchered your name, Julie. I'm I'm so sorry. Uh, but Julie uh, basically like asks, "What games are your guilty pleasure?" So like that's that's what we're talking about uh, right now on this segment of the, of the show. Great guilty pleasure games. Let me tell you how much I love Disney Dreamlight Valley. Let's go. <laughs> Let me tell you. Stop, I, I'm going to stop you right there. There is a Mulan <laughs> event going on right now. Okay. Ooh. I got, I got, I got me my, I got me my, uh, yeah, you gotta, you gotta get it now. There's only 14 days left in the event. You gotta, you know, get your, uh, green combat dress going. Um, yeah, you know, I missed, I missed the Disney parks one. I'm very upset because that was the one I was looking forward to the most. And then I put it down because destiny came out and I missed it. So, uh, let me tell you though. Disney Dreamlight Valley is people obsessed with Animal Crossing. Okay. Disney Dreamlight <laughs> Valley is my Animal Crossing. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. You mentioned that earlier with the uh, nostalgia for for Disney, right? So mm-hmm. here we go. Yeah. We're looping it back in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's he's a Disney adult. Look, man. Wow. I invested so much money in Scrooge McDuck's store. Okay. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I now get a ten percent discount on all items sold through the store. Okay. There yeah, we go. that's a flex. We should really respect him now from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah I feel like that. Well, I feel like it definitely was a flex. You know, more gold flex, for Scrooge's yeah. vault. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, awesome. Okay, by guilty pleasure game. Is it like a game that's like redeemed is not as good as it should be? It's like a, a game that you wouldn't outspokenly say you play a lot. I would say it, it's it a can, game that you're it, it can also be, to tell people that yeah. you play. <laughs> or it could be a game that's not common for you to play. You know. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Like Disney Dreamlight Valley. Yeah. <laughs> Disney Wind, uh, Valley. Unwind after some destiny with uh with some some Disney farming or whatever happens in that game. Look, you gotta you gotta game the system. I I'm out there farming and selling my bananas to fucking Goofy so he can give me coins so I can go buy <laughs> yeah. new outfits from Scrooge, okay? So he can pay for Kingdom Hearts 4. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At a boy. Yeah. Sora will show up in there someday. I don't think I have any guilty. Pl- I'm, only thing that comes to mind is Fortnite. I play that a lot while in between a lot of different games or with my friends. Mm-hmm. But I'm not really the type to go out and be like, hey, my name is Sophie. I play Fortnite. 
Yeah. Every day at 8 p.m. And it's like it's like that's that's kind of my guilty pleasure. Like I don't openly wear it on my chest. It's just it's just I find pleasure in playing Fortnite, and I, I'm I'm guilty in it. So I yeah, like to. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Sorry. I was sorry. I was gonna say like the the concept of the guilty pleasure. Like we're all old or mature enough in some way where it's like you're not ashamed to say that you play a game like that. Yeah. But right. It, it is it could be just like one of those things where like people might not expect that I like to play a certain type of thing. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe some other people would have things that they would like hide their computer monitor if like someone walked in the room or something like that. But <laughs> He's like, get out. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't really have anything where it's like, you know, I would be ashamed to say that I'm playing this or something. But there are yeah. things that are unexpected or in genres that, you know, people may not expect yeah i get that yeah for sure i mean there are tv shows i don't tell people that i used to watch over on because <laughs> we talked about it on a show a couple years ago <laughs> guilty pleasure yeah. tv shows yeah here's the thing i used to be, I used to be really into I mean, reality tv shows look i, I mean watched, i used to, I, I, had a I, watched, I used to be big in, i used to be big in the sailor moon <laughs> i mean i watched i watched gossip Sailor Moon's amazing i don't know what you're yeah. talking about sailor moon's tight uh yeah, it's awesome. okay okay, okay I'll, I'll i'll embarrass myself even more jim and the holograms I mean, it I'm sounds gonna wanna, like a little bit before my time. I mean, yeah, that was definitely before your time. It's, before my time, okay. I'm gonna, <laughs> okay, so 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 Jim, that show like was was around when the original GI Joe show was new. Wow, Ron, <laughs> you're so old. And GI Joe is still ancient to me. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many incarnations of GI Joe. I I I I looked at the um I looked at the Wikipedia for uh for for GI Joe. There's been there's been seven animated series. Yeah, that's what they do. They they that keep is, is they keep playing on yeah. that nostalgia. Keep bringing it back. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. I feel I like mean, GI Joe's in due time to die though, because now they're just like thriving in collaborations. Nothing really original. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, guilty pleasure games for me is like it, it, rhythm games, especially Dance Dance Revolution. And I mean, I, if I walk past if I walk past a cabinet, I will drop some quarters in and play. I Hell love yeah. rhythm games. Rhythm games are definitely my my uh secret ingredient to being happy i love it yeah, too same same and here's the crazy part about it like there like there was when when like when like ddr was just getting off the ground and everything like i would walk past well i used to live in arcades so uh so like i would walk past those machines and i was like there's no way in hell you're gonna catch me jumping up and down that damn thing <laughs> stuff like that one day though i was off from work early um and um and i had to stop by the mall for something so so mm. i always run into an arcade and played and play the whatever flavor of the week fighting game it was i think at the time i think at the time uh marvel the first marvel vs. capcom was out um wow. yeah the first marvel vs. capcom was out so i was in there playing for a little bit and then um and then i just happened to walk past the ddr cabinet and you know like uh like like they they would have covers of songs and stuff like that so i actually heard a hook for for a song that i recognized you know like growing up and stuff like that so i stopped for a moment i just watched it for a second i was like okay let me just drop a couple of, let me just drop a couple of tokens in here and, and see how to play of course of course i did not do well that first that first time so so but then the gamer spirit in me was like hold on I'm gonna get good at this game, so I walked down the GameStop, bought like the oh, two no. PlayStation PlayStation <laughs> Dance Dance Revolution games and the <laughs> gamepad. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and and that was my history. Like I I I played I played DDR. Let me see. So when I discovered that DDR, I want to say like I want to say like third mix was out. So mm. I played DDR from third mix. Five, six, seven. I played nine iterations of, of DR, like in the arcade, you know. So you and, definitely and then, were that, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, I realized because I was because like I was I was getting competitive. I was actually going to tournaments and stuff for, for this game. That's <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, but then it got to a point where I were like one day, like I was playing, I was still having fun, but I was noticing I just wasn't hitting those scores the way I used to. And then, and then one time I was watching an episode of Bat, of, uh, of the Justice League cartoon, and when Amanda Waller was talking about Bruce Wayne and stuff, and talking about how Batman was getting old and slow, so he was losing his edge, I was like, oh shit, that's me in DDR right now. <laughs> it's time. It's time to stop. It's time to uh -huh. hang it up. <laughs> I like how you compared Batman fighting crime to uh, DDR. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's true. Well, you know, it, well, well, just well, just imagine like <laughs> you're like an athlete that's you know gone to the Olympics quite a few times, got your medals and stuff, and you realize you can no longer cat, you can no longer keep up with like. Oh with, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's 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 where I was at. Yeah, it'll happen to LeBron one of these times. It happened to <laughs> it happened to Lightning McQueen in Cars Three. There we go. <laughs> um, I think my like guilty pleasure thing that I wrote down is uh, I play old sports games uh, as like a comfort game, and so like it's not cool to say that you play sports games at this mm-hmm. time uh, and age. If you say you play Madden, people are like, mm, "All right." So. I, I mean, I don't I don't play the new Madden games. I don't think they're good, but I try them every year. Like, you know, during the off season, they'll put like last year's Madden game on Game Pass or something. And I always try it. And I was like, nope, not this one. Maybe next year. But I do play uh, games, sports games from like 2004, 2005. Yes. Uh, which is my nostalgic time, both for sports games, but also for like the time that I cared about football the most Mm -hmm. and the time that like I had the most fun as a fan of football and baseball. So right now on my steam deck, if I'm having a night where like I'm feeling down or my brain is too busy and I can't focus on a game that has a story, I will play MVP baseball 2005 on my steam deck and listen to podcasts. And uh, I did a fantasy draft with the reds and drafted a bunch of players from 2005. I still remember everybody. And that's like a somewhat guilty pleasure because it's like, what are you doing playing this baseball game from 2005, man? Uh, but that's, I mean, that that makes me happy. So I, I'm not really ashamed of like anything that I play really, but this is the closest thing to like the spirit of the uh, the question, I think. That's amazing. I I love that you play sports games from that because that's about the time that I think I probably stopped falling in love with sports games was like yeah the 360 era I would say it was it was Madden 06 the yeah. first one on the 360 was when I was like this is not as good as it was last year yeah I think I yeah. continued to buy the PS2 versions even though I had a 360 <laughs> I think they was kept making the, PS2 games until sports like games? what's up. Was that the downfall of sports games? Mm-hmm. HD, yeah. In, yeah. HD, in my opinion, is the downfall yeah. of sports games because <laughs> yeah. they, they, they were always trying to be realistic with Madden and uh, 2K and stuff like that. But when yeah. they could actually be more realistic, that's when it stopped being fun for me. Now, I will say, when I have a little bit more disposable income, I'm gonna buy that college football game that just came out recently and see how that is. Because mm-hmm. yeah, I know like, a bunch of people are real excited about that. I used to be big into the NCAA uh, yeah. college, college football games. Like, and Me I'm too. like, I'm I'm kicking myself that I haven't even tried this yet. But um, I believe, uh, hold on, on I believe it's, have, I believe it's on PC Game Pass, though, right? If you have EA Play, you get a 10 hour trial. Yeah. Yeah. So. Which is how and I if play you have Madden every Game year. Pass Ultimate. You have EA Play. Yeah, you have Game Pass Ultimate. Yeah, which is uh, how I play Madden every year. I get my ten hours of play, and I'm like, nah, I don't know if I really enjoy this, so I'm not going to buy yeah, it. Yeah, this is enough. Yeah, yeah. see you next yeah. year. That's yep. what I do yeah. too. <laughs> see you after the Super Bowl when you are here full time. <laughs> yeah, when I'm, uh, it's like when it, it, this is all right. This is the guilty thing about this. So I still follow baseball. I watch a lot of games. Um, I edit podcasts when I watch baseball because it's something I can multitask and do. Uh, if my favorite team, the New York Yankees, loses and I'm mad, I will play MVP Baseball 2005 and like take it out <laughs> on the computer. That's a guilty pleasure. <laughs> nice. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I remember when I bought when I got my PS2. The first, the first three games I bought were the Bouncer. NBA Ooh. Live Ooh. 2001 and Madden 2001. And I just, yeah. Oh, man. Eddie George was on the cover. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. So good. I was like, th- that was the game I pointed to. And I was like, games will never look better than this. Yeah. Well, of course, I was wrong. <laughs> but, you know. Final Fantasy X was one of those, just to loop that back in real quick. When I first played Final Fantasy X, I was like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. The opening cutscene with the, like, the, the bubble when they're all playing uh blitz ball yeah. in the bubble and you see Lauren standing on the edge and the, the big tidal wave that's sin comes. Oh, so good. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was good. That was impressive oh, for so its time. Good. So good. I hope you had a I hope you had Devil May Cry in your PS2 collection at some point too. I've it's one of my favorite PS2 games. Yeah. Oh I've, yeah. The only I have a love hate relationship with Devil May Cry because I I love Devil May Cry one, could not stand Devil May Cry two, love no, Devil May Cry well three, uh-huh. <laughs> and Devil May Cry four really pissed me off. DMC Devil May Cry basically like restored my faith in Devil May Cry, even though <laughs> even though everybody disavows that game. And Devil May Cry five I think is pretty good. Okay, okay. The DMC Devil May Cry, I feel like it is a very good game. Not a good Devil May Cry game, but it's a very good game, regardless. Because it drops all thematically the vibes from Devil May Cry. It it, it loses its charm, right? But it's still a very good narratively and gameplay-wise a good game, right? Yeah. Um, Devil May Cry 4, what do you mean you you hate it? Like, what's your your, uh, your nitpicks? That's what I want. Okay. Okay, so I I I'm I I literally was pissed off that I played half a game as not Dante to then get Dante and play the game in reverse. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was really that is really what pissed me off. And the cool and the thing about it is Nero's a cool fucking character. I don't think he was that cool and I don't think he was cool in Devil May Cry 4 though. I don't. Like he's cool as shit in Devil May Cry uh, 5 and like in a lot and a lot of this, the like the the spin-off stuff because like he winds up being guest characters and like in like games aren't even related to Devil May Cry and like I feel like he's so much cooler since his yeah. introduction than he ever yeah. was when he first debuted. That's true. He was definitely yeah. more of the gangsty teen version and Dante was more sort of like mature yeah. comedic guy. <laughs> Man. All right guys. Let's get into these questions. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Because I want to get through them because we have a lot. If you want to ask us questions, if you want to write in, you can join our Discord, join the Boss Rush Network Discord, look for our Twitter thread, write in on Patreon. Or as some people do, leave comments on YouTube, which is great. Do that. Our first question comes from Sam Hall via Patreon. Hey, you big bossies and the king of the backlog. I hope your weeks are going well. My question this week is an oldie but a goodie. If you were stuck on a desert island, what three games would you take with you? Thanks for all the great content. Uh, I'll go first because it's easy. Breath of the Wild because I need that open world adventure game. Tetris. Yeah. Tetris effect specifically because the music's so good. Uh, but Tetris is like my favorite game of all time, probably. Uh, and then Destiny 2 because... I don't know if I'm alone on an island. I need to talk to friends, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's awesome. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's, a, that's a good roster. Yeah. Laurent? Yeah. All right. Well, um, I just updated an answer because like, oh, uh, because here we go. I, I yeah, I had to uh, like the like the final version of Mass Effect 3. That's one of them. That's one of them for sure. And I, I'm, I'm not going to say anything more because we've got someone that's playing through it right now. So I'm not going to say anything yep, more. Completely blind. Yeah. Uh, Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. Now, this is a weird one for me because like, I actually like Monster Hunter World Iceborne more than I like Sunbreak. But Sunbreak, in my opinion, had a lot of nice diversity for like a mm-hmm. monster Hunter formula yeah. honestly sunbreak uh sunbreak plays like a um, like like if, if monster Hunter was like arcadey and i and and that was really refreshing for me and stuff like that mm-hmm. so yeah and then uh dead space 2 because dead space 2 is my favorite out of all four uh, of, of all well all three of the original games uh it's uh it, it still got this it still has the scares but it's kind of like how like if dead space was like was like the 1979 alien and Dead, Dead Space 2 is definitely in 1986 as Aliens. Mm-hmm. Right. Let's hope, that Let's hope that remake is made. I, yeah. want, I want the Dead Space 2 remake. Dead, yeah, I, I really want the Dead Space 2 remake. Yeah. Honestly, honestly, I want them to go ahead and just, just go ahead and just Dead Space <laughs> 1, 2, and 3. If they need to retcon, majorly retcon shit from Dead Space 3, I understand, even though I love Dead Space 3. Like, you know, it's not my favorite out of all the games, but in all right. seriousness... The stuff that did in Dead Space Three, I will say, was was kind of bold, even if it wasn't f- the vision they wanted, because there was a lot of meddling from like from like the uh, execs and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. for how Dead Space Three came out. It wasn't the it wasn't the scariest Dead Space game, but it was, in my opinion, it was very fun, especially the co op mode, because like if you play the co op mode right, you get uh, you get all the story. Mm. Oh yeah, nice. Yep, those are those those are my picks. Nice, cool. 
Uh, for me, I have an open world game. I have Elden Ring. It's uh, one of my favorite games ever. I'm Son a huge of a bitch. Like that's what you that's what you would be stuck with for the rest of your life. Yes. I would be yes. Only I would a true be, Souls fan would have that in his in his lineup forever. I would be I happy. You, Dave. Thank I'm you. With you. Thank you. I'm with I you. I'm a huge so I'm a huge Souls guy. Um, those games are comfort games for me, and Elden uh, Ring okay. is the biggest. Elden Ring has the most variety in how you can mm-hmm. play. Mm-hmm. So Preach. give me that. Yeah, um, man. Well, shit. Like, I mean, like, okay, if you like getting kicked in your balls, have you played Super Ghouls and Ghosts lately? Oh, no. <laughs> different different <laughs> kind of getting kicked in your balls, for sure. Um, this is a this is a whole thing. I'm not going to make this like a big speech, but the reason that I love Souls games is not how difficult they are. Uh, I tolerate difficult boss fights so that I can get to the other parts of the games that I think from software does better than anybody else out there. Uh, so, um, Elden ring, uh, my other one, I will probably take a sports game. Uh, I don't know what, like maybe rocket league. Like this, is this the opportunity where I finally get good at rocket league is if I'm on a desert <laughs> Island and I have no other choice. Maybe. Uh, cause I, I think rocket league is an amazing game, but I'm not going to play it enough in my regular life to actually be good at it. So in this scenario, maybe that's maybe that's what I, I can do. And then uh, I will take the opportunity and like the unlimited free time, I guess you'd have on a desert island to finally play Final Fantasy 14 because I love Final Fantasy, but I just I just can't fathom starting now and playing like a thousand hours of it. It yeah. seems insurmountable to me. So give me this scenario Assuming we have internet, uh, Corey already said he's playing Destiny, so we have internet in this uh, mm-hmm. scenario. So let in me this scenario, yeah, yeah. Give me, give me FF fourteen. I will finally get the chance to to see what all the hype is about. See, I'm an antisocial gamer. Well, I mean, I love playing. I love playing online. You're games, a Monster so Hunter would... player. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, I will solo. I will solo all day in Monster Hunter. That's that's me the too. crazy. Part. I would mostly solo. But well, here's the thing about it. There's history behind me and soloing it because like I in, in in my circle of friends, like I I I've been playing the Monster Hunter franchise the longest. I was playing it when it was an unknown game that was that was literally hard as fuck to play. Like, I mean, because there was because like there were the learning curve in Monster Hunter was so steep and everything. So like it's so, like Monster Hunter One came out in 2004. You know, like me and some buddies played it. They they quit playing it after like, you know, like the servers closed off and everything like that. I but Monster Hunter didn't do that well in the West. So um so but I loved it to the point where I was like, okay, I'm I modded my PS2 and I started importing the games from Japan and stuff like that. So yeah. I was playing I was playing games I couldn't even understand, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know you but, understand Monster Hunter. Yeah. Uh so yeah, so like I was playing I so I played all the Monster I played as much of Monster Hunter 2 as I can because I could not go online and play it because like I I'm not from Japan and like they ban you off their servers they they discover you there and stuff like that. So um so then when the PSP versions came out, like nobody wanted to buy a PSP and play Monster Hunter with me. So I was playing by myself for for go until monster hunter freedom unite came out freedom unite is i think the one that finally like woke everybody up to like how good the series was and stuff like that you know but by that point i was like you know what i've learned so much about the game that i don't need to play with a party if if i actually call somebody and say hey i need your i, I need you to play this quest for me it's just because the quest required two people to play it didn't it didn't so much because i i just wanted to quest with you <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I, I became an anti-social monster hunter gamer and then when like you know of course like world and iceborne come came out and everything everybody was back into it everybody had systems and wanted to be able to play it and stuff like that and mm-hmm. but but then they were pissed off at me because i was i was like leagues ahead of them <laughs> because i because i knew what the fuck i was doing <laughs> mm. awesome. so yeah yeah uh my three games right uh my three games I will say, because Dave said this, I'm going to say it too. Final Fantasy 14 would be one of them because I haven't played it. Mm-hmm. My friends play it. I don't play it. And again, as a fan of the Final Fantasy franchise, I I know 100% that if I spent time on that game, I will sink in so many hours that I will probably forget I am stranded on an island. Right? Yeah. So that is a game that has like, with all the DLC and all the expansions packs, it's just like thousands of hours just waiting for me to 
just like to spend so much time on. So that definitely that. And it, for the same reason, Baldur's Gate 3 is going to yeah. be one mm, I that's a great want to bring onto this island. Yeah, that's a great All one. the different branching ways I can. It could be a new game every time I start up a whole campaign. Yeah. Yeah. For me, you know, I can mix around who I bring out of my party. I can mix around which path I take. I can mix around what type of sort of behavior my character can have with other characters. And again, for the same reason, like spend a lot of time on, that's one of them. But a game that I want to go into that doesn't isn't really as narratively powerful or in your face would be, uh, yeah, Elden Ring. I'd say Elden Ring would be another game I'd bring onto the Stranded Island with me it's a good because call. because I am a Soulsborne fan and uh, that is my medicine. You know, I could cure me; it can fix me. Elden Ring yeah. is a uh, yeah, it's a good <laughs> game, and I want it Yo. to be. You guys in these MMOs, though, MMOs intimidate me. Like I remember, I remember trying to muddle my way through Final Fantasy XI, and I was like, I can't do this. I, I, I can't. <laughs> There's yeah. just too much going on. But I think my problem was I was trying to do it Final Fantasy XI on the PlayStation, when I honestly should have been trying it on the PC. Mm. Maybe that could have been it. Yeah. I've never played an MMO, and it's partly because I don't like playing games with other people. I'm also uh, an antisocial gamer for the most part. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Nothing wrong. No. With it. Yeah. I, I played I played a bunch of Monster Hunter Rise and I did it all solo. Um, I just don't I don't care. I don't want to play with other people. Uh, it, FF14, they say you can play it by yourself. So whatever. I, like, yeah. that's cool. But uh, it's just it's just so much time. So I need to be I need to have zero responsibilities in order to actually play that game. For sure. Yeah. Man. Final Fantasy 14. It's scary. Yeah. <laughs> um, our next question, uh, real quick, we'll just we'll run through these last few here. Uh, Marine Gamer twelve eighty nine via YouTube asks, uh, "What are your favorite license games?" Uh, I was thinking about how Luke and Corey were talking about Batman Arkham and Transformers last week, and thought there have been some pretty decent license games in recent memory, as well as a lot of older ones. What do you say? Um. I have to shout out X Men Origins Wolverine, which is something I kicked. I kicked myself after we recorded <laughs> last week that I did not mention that game. Mm. Um, that game is incredible. Uh, I also really liked IDOS Montreal's uh, Guardians of the Galaxy game. Yeah, dude, I loved that game. That game's great. People are not talking about it enough. I feel like yeah. it is such a hidden gem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that game was cool. Uh, and then the recent, not just not just turtles in time which i've written down here from the turtles game but like the recent run of turtles games like shredder's revenge yeah. is really good splinter fate is good the cowabunga collection like really pulled together all those classic games like mm -hmm. those are just some that i wanted to shout out dave yeah, uh, I've got the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater games, uh, licensed skaters, licensed music. The music is like great, basically shaped my taste in music when I was 11 or 12 years old. Mm -hmm. So Tony Hawk Pro Skater, uh, the Lord of the Rings movie games from like the PS2, GameCube, Xbox era, those rule. Uh, I did an episode recently on Tales from the Backlog about the Return of the King game and like I played it again this like I think it was last year, but it it still rules. Uh, so those games are great. And the South Park RPGs, the Stick of Truth Ooh. and the Fractured But Whole, legitimately good RPGs and the best thing South Park has made since those games came out. Mm. I, I would say they're the best South Park thing since the Warcraft episode of South Park. Yeah, it's probably <laughs> like since that era, those games are the best South Park thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the games are pretty good. Uh, I don't know if this counts, but I want to say Lego Marvel superheroes. Oh, it yeah, counts. That's, yep, that's double yeah. licensing. <laughs> yeah, double licensing. Lego yeah. Marvel superheroes, uh, the first one. The second one, not as much. I think that one was really done well because they brought out characters that, especially at the time, like pre- not pre, but like early MCU, where people like uh, only knew a couple handful of characters, at least people who weren't really into the comics. Mm -hmm. uh, while like 
Lego Marvel, right? They brought out just a whole it was a massive cast of characters into the game. And I really appreciated that growing up. And yeah, I thought it was awesome. Uh, I am being clouded by nostalgia. I feel like if I got back into Lego Marvel superheroes, I wouldn't like it as much. But uh, I don't got to worry about that now because I'm playing Mass Effect. But yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> Lego Marvel superheroes is definitely something that I hold to high regards, especially for mm -hmm. a licensed game. Yeah. Laurent. Is it me? Yep. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, I, I kind of did. I kind of went specific on my games. Uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Um, yep. Honestly, I mean, I can also lump the Force Unleashed like the first one because I the second one kind of was lackluster for me, even though like it, it ratcheted up a lot of the crazy shit that, you know, like Starkiller could do. Like, I felt like it was a little over the top, even for a Star Wars game at that point. But yeah. Fallen Order for sure was I, I feel like it was the first Star Wars game that was, I, I could finally take Star the Star Wars franchise seriously, because I mean, I've I played I played the battle, the Battlefront games. Um, I played like the Super NES, like, you know, Star Wars. Wars games that were basic they're supposed to be based off of all the off, all the movies and all that stuff like it, it didn't really do it for me um but fallen order was definitely good i feel like they 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 fleshed out the story and the fact that disney turned around was like hey this is this just canon <laughs> you know like yeah like mm. i love that, it that was pretty cool of them yeah. yeah yeah um dragon ball z kakarot um now i'm now I've played like Budokai, Tenkaichi, even Fighter Z and stuff like Fire 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 Z is 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 phenomenal and stuff like that. But the fact that Kakarot kind of like took you through like all the greatest hits, it kind of reminded me of um of a game that never was released in the states, but was out during like this the PS One Sega Saturn era in Japan, uh, Dragon Ball Z Legends. It was like retelling. It was like retelling of like all the like all the big franchise battles and stuff like that. That was amazing, and Kakarot definitely like like did that for me. So that's that's one of them. And then some, and then Spider Man Miles Morales. I had to I had to go hard on this one because mm -hmm. like Spart Marvel like like Marvel Spider Man, Miles Morales, and Spider Man Two. In my opinion, they are all great games. But Miles Morales, even though it's a it's it's a shorter play time than the uh, than the other two, I feel like Miles Morales. That was an A plus plus game. It's the best one, in my opinion. Good stuff. Yeah. So, um, all right. So we're gonna only answer two more questions and save the rest for next week. Uh, just because we're gonna be here for another like three hours if we answer these questions. But <laughs> so uh, Stephanie wrote in. Uh, Stephanie, we miss you. Uh. She wrote in and asked, happy birthday to the Game Boy. Any fun memories or top games from the era? Uh, I actually have my game, my original Game Boy complete inbox sitting back there on my shelf. Uh, nice. My it was wow. the first console that I ever owned. Like we had an Atari 2600, uh, but it, it was like my dad's and we could only play it when he was home and whatever. But my grandma got me that uh the year the year it came out, I was three and I had no idea how to play video games, but it was fine. Um, 1989 Tetris and boxing. And then my cousin ended up giving me his copies of, uh, follow the foot clan, which was the first Ninja Turtles game and super Mario land. Uh, and then I ended up getting, you know, a bunch of other crappy games, uh, because I was a child. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was, uh, that's my top game boy story. That's my favorite why it's still sitting back there my uh, two favorite games back there too complete inbox wow. i have a link to the past the game boy color version complete inbox uh back there and then um super mario land is also back there complete inbox nice game boy era i'm like that's definitely not my that's way way before my era oh geez i think okay. a game that can actually genuinely say that I adored in that era is Tetris, uh, Pokemon Red and Blue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if this was from the Game Boy era, maybe the Game Boy Advance era, but the uh, uh, Bomberman series. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I loved Bomberman. Uh, but those are, yeah, those are a couple of my favorites. Yeah, there was a Bomberman on the Game Boy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, awesome then. Yeah. 
Definitely love nice. those. Like sort of simple, but then like it just it just grabs you and doesn't let you go. You know, once it catches you. Yeah. Uh, for me, I have a memory of getting a Game Boy with Pokemon Red for Christmas in 1998. Uh, my brother got a Game Boy and Pokemon Blue, and uh, so like I had a Game Gear before that, but I like. I, I like played games on it and I had fun, but it was like one of many things that I liked doing with my free time, you know, when I was a kid. And then when Pokemon and the Game Boy entered my life, it was like, I'm just playing video games all the time. And like, <laughs> I'll go outside and play with my friends sometimes. But like, if I'm in the house or in the car or at school or on the school bus, I'm playing mm. Pokemon on the Game Boy. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my main memory of the the Game Boy, the original one. Yeah, it's, am- it's amazing how much pokemon just extended the life of that console because it was dead like the game it's, boy was essentially dead the game boy yeah. the original game boy and then like the game boy pocket which we got the game boy pocket but mm-hmm. it, the game boy pocket was functionally the same it was just smaller right mm-hmm. yeah so the yeah the fact like the when did the game boy come out like 89 or 89, something yep and then yep. i got a game boy color in 2001 so like that's an insane lifespan for a yeah. handheld piece of or any any Game Boy like or any uh, video game console basically. Mm-hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be absolutely respectful because uh, people know people know my relationship with uh, with Nintendo. Like Here Nintendo knew how to fucking do it back in those days. Yeah, yeah, uh, that was a positive thing about Nintendo. Write that down, everybody. <laughs> Write it down. No, 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 no. I was, uh, I, I, I finally remember to launch the Game Boy. I, I do, I do, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I do. I think my mom hated the fact that you know, like I, I wanted one of those damn things because I mean, like, uh, like <laughs> ticking them off, tick, ticking them off real quickly. The Double Dragon game for for Game Boy, uh, Mega Man's two, three, and four for the Game Boy, mm-hmm. uh, Legend of Zelda: Link's Awakening for the Game Boy. Of yeah. course, Tetris and um and 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 uh and Operation Contra. Mm-hmm. God, those I have emulate. I have emulators, and I have those games emulated. That's all I'm going to say. You know, because I love my Rog Ally, which I which I'm thinking about selling to Corey. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. They just put those Mega Man games on NSO on the Game yeah. Boy service. Uh, I actually just like played a little bit of them a couple days ago because I every day I forget about NSO and then like every three months or so I'll boot it up and be like, oh, they probably added stuff. Let's see what's new. And it's like all these Mega Man games. All right, cool. Check these out. Yeah. I thought it was so cool with the Game Boy because I had this carrying case with like a big strap on it. It was like a messenger bag for my Game Boy. Mm-hmm. That, that my older cousins just made everybody fun of had that yeah i know you have that i know but i thought it was cool when i was like four or five okay so sh- <laughs> shut it it's cool and you get you get like a a case that has little slots to put your cartridges in yeah and uh get that worm light yeah and then i had like the big magnifying glass with the speakers and the light on it oh yeah yeah i had that shit i had that <laughs> All right, our last our last question is specifically for Dave okay. from Jacob McCourt. He says he asks uh, he says ask Dave about what it's like transporting consoles halfway around the world in his suitcases. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Jacob, for that. A shout out to Jacob. Lovely, lovely person. Um, so I, I moved uh, from the U.S. to South Korea, and then I moved from South Korea back to the U.S. And wow. both times I took consoles with me. And uh, if you've never flown with a console, uh, here's the thing. They can't go unchecked bags. They have to be in carry-on luggage. So uh, carry-on space is at a premium if you really care about what's in the bags. So uh, the wow. first time I moved out there, my one carry on was just my Xbox 360 and my Wii U and associated accessories. <laughs> that is all that was in the bag. That was all I had space for uh, in the, you know, they, they can only be so big. So that was one way. And then on the way back, my wife and I came together. So we had two carry on bags between the two of us. One of them was our dog who we brought on the plane with us, but he counted as a carry on bag. 
The other carry on bag was just my PS5 because it's the only thing that can fit in a carry on size uh, suitcase because that thing's so big. Yeah. So that is the experience of uh, taking consoles halfway around the world is uh, you better plan for that because that is uh, you're dedicating prime luggage space to those. And when I flew back uh, from Korea, my personal item, as I call it, my backpack, was, it had my switch in it and uh, some other related stuff that was not allowed to go in carry on bags like my laptop or in checked bags like my laptop. So uh, that's that's how it works. And so the the process is you better plan for it. And uh, you it, I, I joked that, you know where your priorities lie with something like that. Because it's like, well, I'm taking what's important to me when I move across the world. <laughs> yeah. I'm taking my Wii U, baby. That's what's important to me. <laughs> Man, like my first my first year of the ROG Ally, like I like like I I, I I flew across country a couple of times. And man, that that was interesting because uh, because, yeah, like uh, it was so brand new that it was so brand new that the TSA didn't even know what the fuck it was. <laughs> yeah, that's a bad feeling when yeah. you're like trying to explain yeah. technology to TSA. Uh uh-uh. uh. Mm. Yeah, I got stopped on the way to PAX actually because I had like a uh, some audio equipment in my carry on, and mm-hmm. they like the little the XLR attachments look like little <laughs> bomb cylinders. <laughs> 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 oh, it was awful. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you're carrying around a big black brick around you, especially in an airplane, people are going to race mm-hmm. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> well, we did it, everybody. yeah we're gonna call it there uh awesome everybody out there thank you for watching and or listening to this episode of the boss rush podcast dave thank you for joining us tonight where yeah can people find you so yeah first of all thank you Corey and leron and good to meet you sophie uh it's been great chatting with you all here tonight thank you um yeah and so if people want to find me the the best place is on the tales from the backlog podcast uh, which is everywhere you listen to podcasts, also on YouTube. If you want to listen to podcasts on YouTube, which apparently most people don't want to do, uh, I've seen the the metrics uh, for you know watch time on YouTube. But anyway, I digress. You can find Tales from the Backlog anywhere you listen to this kind of thing. And uh, again, it's weekly deep dives into one game in particular in each episode, in depth. No spoilers for a while. We'll warn you when the spoilers begin. So if you've always wondered about games like, uh, let's see what's coming up on the show. We've got uh, Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth, Pizza Tower, Dave the Diver, and Animal Well. Those are the games for August. If you wondered about those uh, but don't want to be spoiled, you can listen to my show. And if you played those and want to hear a deep dive, uh, kind of like spoiler cast conversation, we have that too. So that is uh, Tales from the Backlog. All right. Nice. So there'll also be there also be links in the show notes uh, to the show. So you guys can thank you. Easy access. Yeah. How we like it. Uh, Sophie, thanks for joining us as well. This was this. Was no great. worries. Um, no worries. Awesome. Thank you for having me again. Maybe what? next time if I'm on, I'll be a bit more prepared. Well, <laughs> to be fair, this was like uh, we this is literally like a five minutes before the show started type thing. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you, you did great. Yeah. Yeah, Awesome. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where, where can people find you? People can find me, uh, writing articles for boss rush.net. Um, I have only released a couple right now, more to come. Uh, and I, yeah, that's about it, really. Cool, cool. We'll uh, we'll make sure to link some of the articles uh, in the show notes from Sophie in the what I say show notes. Yeah, show notes. Uh, Sweet, Leron. Thank you for your time as well, as always. Oh, yeah. Always, and everybody out always there. Remember to like, subscribe, share, rate, and review wherever you listen or watch. Maybe you can support us on Patreon at patreoncom slash network. Check out all of our content on bossrush.net. Thank you so much for watching and or listening. Until next time, we love you. Goodbye. If you want to see how you can become a Patreon producer, head on over to patreon.com slash Network. The Patreon producers for this month are Adriel Munger, Austin Campbell, 
Celeste Roberts, Christian S., Sana Dierig, Francisco Santilan, Matthew Keel, and Todd Oxtra. Thanks for your continued support of the Boss Rush Network.